questioning everything today with Sheila Henson, ADHD coach Sheila. Sheila is on Patreon. She's on TikTok, has an immense following. What is this? 93.9K followers. Girl, I got like 230. Oh, no. I'll, I'll, I'll let people know about you. Please, please. And then she is on Instagram as ADHD coach Sheila. I love that your brand is consistent everywhere you go. You can look up ADHD coach Sheila and you pop up. Tell me a little bit about this ADHD coaching. Um, I kind of made it up. Apparently it's a thing that other people do, <laughs> but, um, I got like my like intro to coaching story is so long. So I'm just going to like snip it into, I had some people who were trying to help me become a family business coach just cause I was always good with people and stuff like that. And then I was like, Oh, what other kind of coaching can I do? Cause I was on like Fiverr, you know, doing it for five bucks a pop, trying to get going as like a oh, side wow. thing. Cause I was working, I was teaching at a nonprofit. So it's not profitable. Um, and so, <laughs> um, I was like, Oh, I need a side gig. And I was like, Oh, well, I know a ton about ADHD. Cause I have it. My family has it. I've worked with neurodivergence since 2004, like my whole adult life. Um, and so I was like, Oh, I can do that. And it, and it took off. Um, but I, I never did a coaching certification. I like a lot of the stuff in like the coat, like life coaching world was like a real turnoff to me because it was very like money based and things like that. And it was just very not neurodivergent friendly because mm. the things that work for neurotypical people are going to not, we're going to have completely different barriers and things like that. So I was like, oh, um, I'm just going to do what I would have wanted. <laughs> Like, and I, I ended up talking to these, uh, I had these like million, multi-million dollar millionaire, like business guys who were coaching me because like as a trade, like, oh, I'll help you with some of the like emotional stuff of business coaching. And, and you can help me with some of the business stuff of emotional stuff, you know, and Ooh. they were giving me great advice, which was essentially just like, just do it. Like ask for a million dollars, just do it. Like you know, you know, people who have money, like they're, you know, they're like, Oh, you know, rich people, $300 an hour is a drop in the bucket to them. Just, just ask for, for whatever and just do it. And I'll, you know, I, I don't charge $300 an hour, but um, I, that mentality of just like, Oh, I can just make a business and I'm going to do it how I want to do it. And I'm going to try to do it in like with my values and, um, the way that I would have wanted, what I would have wanted to have when I was undiagnosed in my twenties and struggling. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I call myself a coach. There's no better word for it, but I do a lot of different things, including like mediation things. And, um, I don't know, like couple stuff. I do family stuff. I do behavior stuff. I do, you know, all of that, but, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Wow. I provide like practical supports as well as like change in mindset. But for a lot of people with neurodivergence, that mindset can't change until they start seeing progress because they feel so stuck. So we start with something like, oh, you're not eating because you forget to, or the food's too far away. So we're going to just start with like keeping some peanut butter packets by your bed so that you're actually eating in the morning, you know, during the day. And then we work all the way up to like, like, Hey, you need a raise. You haven't asked for a raise. Like we need to get you asking for a raise. Hey, maybe you need a whole new job. Hey, maybe you and your partner need to talk about, like, about things that you haven't talked about for 10 years, you know, like you know, all these different things. Um, yeah. So it gets, it's very individualized, I guess. Yeah. That sounds like it. That's a lot to unpack and I am excited to unpack it. So family, family business coaching. And did you say, did I hear that right? Yeah, it was um, some friends of uh, our mutual friend, Lindsay, who were mm -hmm. uh, our, our business coaches, like they help people to like sell their businesses, their big, you know, wealthy businesses. Like and exiting? Yeah, like exiting, exactly. The okay. exiting stuff. Um, and so some of those people were like, oh, there's a lot of like emotional uh, parts to this that they're not equipped for, they don't have that like kind of communication mediation background, right? And right. so when someone's saying like, oh, I, I can't sell my business because that's my identity, that's my, and they're coming up with these different excuses because they're not really being honest with themselves. And then that who's the, who's the business going to end up getting inherited by? And then there's all these, right? Like it ends up being a lot of actual like mediation that needs to happen and like stuff like that. So I, uh, Lindsay recommended, she was like, oh, I know a person who, who does people stuff and like recommended me to them. 
yeah. <laughs> it sounds exactly like how she would say it. <laughs> yeah. I know the person totally. that does people stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's awesome. So for those of you that don't know who Lindsay is, Lindsay is another YouTube, a fellow influencer, thought leader. And she, you can find her on YouTube as, as Lindsay makes videos or dids. Um, I think either Lindsay makes videos or Zamdanga on YouTube. That's right. She's definitely Zamdanga. Lindsay makes videos on TikTok. That's the only one that I know. Okay. Okay. Lindsay is awesome. Lindsay is the reason that I'm talking to ADHD coach Sheila now, but funny story. I actually found you on TikTok through the recommended for me because at some point, I guess I mentioned ADHD and the algorithm said, ADHD coach Sheila, yeah, she knows all I about this. I was following you as well. When Lindsay was like, oh, this is uh, my friend Gregory. And I was like, we're mutuals. Like how we were already following each other. I didn't even realize that. Yeah. <laughs> Holy cow. So yeah, I've been watching you for a minute. And then to find out that we know each other. Yeah, that's really cool how things work out. There are no coincidences. So I actually have a friend that's working on an exit strategy for her business. She built an app. I won't go too far into it, but she's looking to sell it now. I'm going to connect y'all. Cool. I haven't done any of that coaching for real yet, just for FYI. But I'm, I'm, uh, I could do that. <laughs> you don't I mean, have like, to be a subject matter expert. What you talked about, yeah. you said, I found a problem that I had, and I know that other people have that problem, and I created a solution. That's business, that's coaching. Yeah, hundred percent. You got this. <laughs> so neurodivergent. I know what that means. You know what that means. Tell our tell our listeners, what is neurodivergence? Oh man, I feel like I should quote the person who Absolutely. Do actually it. came up with that term. <laughs> no. So like there's neuro, the idea of neurodiversity is that there's a bunch of, I'm going to try to talk while I find this. Do um, it, do it, girl. Gonna, there's a bunch of different, I like to say flavors of brains, right? Like there's, and uh, so like, just like there's diversity in culture or, you know, all of these different things, there's also diversity in thought and like, the, and the way that our brains work. And that the idea of neurodiversity is that one is not superior to another, although our society has been built specifically for one type, which we call neurotypical, right? Because that is the one that uh, doesn't have extra struggles in this society. So for a, a, a neurodivergent person might be someone who's autistic, ADHD, dyslexic, um, schizophrenic, bipolar, any of those things, because their experience of the world is different. Um, on a, in, in an internal sense. And I think, and I've been actually just going down a rabbit hole and like this whole other part of neurodiversity, which is just that different people have different uh, ways of thinking and like having thoughts. So like some people have an internal monologue, they hear words, some people see pictures. For other people, it's like just a concept. And then other people, it's like all three and like talking to people who don't have words in their brains, how they have to translate from this conceptual uh, muddle into words in order to have a conversation um, and like versus the people that like myself I'm thinking in words there's no there's no translation so I can speak very quickly and like and easily um, and and other people can't and so when I'm coaching on like self-talk um, and and things like self-coaching then uh, I have to I'm now having to keep in mind that some people are not hearing voices in their head they have to actually do that translation anyway it's kind of a side tangent but the idea of neurodiversity is that there is, uh, if you're autistic, if you're ADHD, if you're bipolar, that doesn't mean that you are less than, it doesn't mean that you are flawed. It means that you're having a different experience that this world was not uh, created for. And so we do need certain accommodations and certain understandings um, that haven't been accessible to us for a long time. That is beautiful. See, I'm glad you brought that up because I was diagnosed with ADHD in seventh grade, put on Ritalin, felt like I was trapped inside my own body still have the same thoughts, still have the same energy, can't connect it. And I got myself off of it about a year into it. I just started abusing them, chopping them up and snorting them and, you know, the stuff that kids do. But that was, I mean, like you're chopping up and snorting something that's like cocaine and cocaine for us does not do anything. It just makes us normal. Everyone else is in the room talking and you're like, 
I'm focused. <laughs> right. So I said all that to say, I, I go on tangents sometimes. Love it. ADHD, that's our way. <laughs> but, but we follow each other. Yeah. <laughs> And I love, I, I want to say this, I love that you have your backdrop is an actual window. <laughs> and I actually saw a squirrel while you were talking. Oh, they're, they're there watching me. I also have this little raccoon, which is my other, other favorite animal. <laughs> he holds my That's going to be the inside joke. Raccoon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so good. what I was going to say is there's nothing wrong with you. You're just having a different experience in the world. Yeah. I love that you said that. Now there's those, you said we need different accommodations. We may need different accommodations. There's that part on the application that says, would you need any reasonable accommodation for us to, to do your job? And I've always, always skipped that because I'm like, I'm not gonna use ADHD as a crutch. I'm not gonna use bipolar as a crutch. I don't need any help and then something happens at the job where who I am comes out, but if they would have known, that would have probably been a different story. They probably would have been able to accommodate. They probably would have put me in the resource classes for, for work. <laughs> uh, but w could you speak to some, I know there's other people that feel like they, they can't do that. They should it might bar them from employment, like telling people that you're not available on Friday and Saturday. Oh my God, they won't give me the job if I don't put, I'm available every day, all day. And then you put that and then they're like scheduling you all day, every day. And you're like, why are you scheduling me all day, every day? Well, because that's what you told me. There's like a lot to that. Oh, and I will say, uh, sociologist Judy Singer is the one who came up with the neurodiversity um, idea and she is autistic and uh, yeah, anyway, you should look into her, she's great. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so there's a lot with that, the idea that we need accommodations, we have to ask for accommodations and not every job or school is open to that because there is this stigma that, you know, ADHD is like you said, it's an excuse that you're making excuses that you're somehow lazy or, um, you know, the, uh, a little, uh, name for an ADHD -er is like the lazy perfectionist because we're so obsessed with being perfect and, and have this huge fear of failure and yet have such trouble getting started doing things that are never doing as enough. We always feel like we should be doing more and, and all of these things. Um, and so, um, we have, so there, okay, I lost my train, but I'm coming back. So the, uh, there are certain jobs where you can't ask for accommodations. Uh, if, for example, if you are a police officer or if you are in the military, uh, you cannot be on ADHD medication, which is terrifying. It's the people that have guns uh, and have an impulsivity disorder are not allowed to treat that disorder. Um, so... <laughs> And even Whoa. if they disclose that to a therapist, there's hit the, I, I know this at least for military, I'm not entirely sure for police officers, but uh, HIPAA does not apply. So anything, if you're in the military and you speak to your therapist, the therapist, your boss, your, your superiors can go to your therapist and get all of that information. Um, and so they can't even get proper uh, therapy. Um, and so sometimes that fear is real <laughs> and, and those wow. limits are real. Um, which is unfortunate because military and police are, are fantastic jobs uh, for ADHD if you if you think those are good jobs to, that to exist in the first place. Um, and so like, um, <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, it's funny that you say that. I know that for me, learning to cope with and, and overcome because I don't want to be medicated, I want to learn how to manage. Yeah. Manage your weaknesses, but emphasize or, or boost focus on your strengths, right? Yeah. So I learned at some point through something I saw on social media or somewhere, I don't know, I see stuff all the time everywhere. I connect dots from everywhere, but it said that people like us, neurodivergence, need to have something that keeps their brain and their body busy at the same time. Yes. When I was a barista, my whole story with the barista to where I'm at now came from me taking a role where I knew I would move and think at the same time. And I shine so hard. I even told myself, don't shine here. Stay, stay small. And I blew up so much that I got hired onto the tech company, learned more about tech, became a UX designer and moved up to senior in a year and a half. So in a matter of two years, 
actually three years total from the time I took the barista job to where I'm at today. Holy cow. Yeah. But that. You have to have both going at the same time. It, it, uh, at the way that I see it is I like to think of it as ADHD is a toddler that lives in your brain. It's a cute, <laughs> cute little toddler. It's true. <laughs> right? Like a precious, like people get mad. They call their ADHD Karen or whatever, Chad. I don't like that, right? Your, no. your ADHD is not malicious. No. It just needs support like a kid. So it's like a toddler and you have to, while the grownups are working, you have to keep the toddler busy. So if you're doing something with your hands, that means you put on a podcast, you put on some music, you put on something for your brain that, and to, uh, to entertain the toddler. And if you're doing something with your brain, if I'm watching a movie, I'm doodling, I'm drawing, I'm, paint, I'm painting my nails, I'm knitting, whatever, like fidget, you know, we, we need fidgets because we have to entertain the children so that the grownups can concentrate. And this also goes into what I think is the most valuable tool, aside from just hanging out with other neurodivergents. I think that the most valuable tool for neurodivergency like, is, is self-coaching, is learning how to speak to yourself in a way that's helpful. And I don't mean waking up in the morning and looking in the mirror and going, I'm beautiful, I'm worth it. Like I'm talking about saying, instead of, oh my God, what's wrong with me? Why can't I do this? I'm so lazy, I'm so stupid. Or you know, it even can go to like, I'm, I, I should just unalive myself, you know? instead of that being able to talk to as if that toddler was saying those things, what would you say to the toddler, right? You wouldn't say, shut up, <laughs> you would say, and you wouldn't say you're right, right? You would be like, hey, buddy, sounds like you're really struggling. Like, what can we do right now? Like, what do you need? Are you hungry? Are you tired? Are you overwhelmed? Do you need us to break this task into little chunks? Do you need some help? Do you need a person to come over and give you some support, right? And so learning to talk to ourselves, learning to talk to our little ADHD toddler in a way that's empathetic and practical um, is a tool that can be used for every single issue with ADHD from executive function to focus to um, rejection sensitive dysphoria, you know, emotional regulation, all of those things. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's a lot of big words. <laughs> We're going to have to break into those. So I love that you're talking about this because I, there's no coincidences. There's a reason we cross paths. There's a lot of people we can help with this, this just this episode, but I did have to learn how to speak to the, I had to find my inner child in a program called Pathways, createagreatlife.org. They, it was a program called You back in the 80s that Dr. Phil owned, he sold it to them. You go in, they don't tell you anything about it. They just tell you to play hard and raise your hand. And you're like, wait, what? You have to fundraise your way in. And then I can't tell you what else happens. They just ask a whole lot of questions, hence question everything because I've never stopped asking questions since. They broke me, but they helped me to find that inner child. And ever since then, I've been nurturing him. And you're right, it is a toddler running my brain. Like there's a, con there's a control center and there's a toddler in there and I gotta put him in his playpen sometimes so that, like you said, the grownups can play, the grown or the grownups can concentrate. I worked at Verizon last year, no, two years ago for a very brief stint, I was a, network technician i'm not even into that i just got an opportunity and i was like yeah i'll try that too because you know we try everything we're great starters mediocre finish or mediocre follow through and what is finishing right yep <laughs> got the job there i'm in the meetings and these are the most left-brained logical analytical thinkers in the world they all need structure and they can they can do this stuff i'm like when do i get to run the courts and I'm in the meeting, I've got the meeting minutes or notes agenda, and I'm doodling because I have to keep the toddler busy. And my boss got mad, said, you got to stop doodling during the meetings. Do you know what happened from there? Your focus is gone. I was not focusing. I was, I was off in another world. I fell asleep one time. I'm just like, yeah, if you, if I'm doodling during a meeting and that meeting ends and they ask me what they, my teachers used to always love this. Gregory, are you paying attention? You're over there drawing this intricate picture. And I'll look at the picture and I'll tell them everything they just said. Yes. Yep. Only took one time and they were like, okay, don't leave. Don't mess with Greg. That's the same. And I think that's, uh, we are lucky because we had teachers who allowed that. And I have, 
I know so many people whose teachers did not, or they were too afraid to advocate for themselves yeah. um, in that way. And I even, I have a 10 year old client who um, was doodling in class and her teacher was like, you can't do that. That's disrespectful. Mom went to the principal and he was like, I have ADHD. I doodle in meetings. She can doodle in class anytime she wants. And I was just like, oh. thank goodness, you know, like, because that could have gone so, so differently. Um, yes. And if that, and if she, that girl didn't have a mom to go advocate for her, then that kid would have just had, you know, been suffering and, and zoning out and things like that. And uh, there are so many, even when I was teaching gen ed um, in Los Angeles, like I had a I had a student who had ADHD and in my classroom, she was doing so well. She would, this is middle school history and she would pace in the back of the room during lecture. Um, and that kept her, she wasn't bothering anybody. She could totally focus if she was just walking back and forth. As soon as she sat in her seat, she's poking the other kids and throwing things, you know, whatever. Um, I love that kid. <laughs> um, but, uh, so the, they, but they called me in for a meeting because uh, I was, you know, a student teacher. And so they were like, you're just giving her the grade. You're trying to get kids to like you. You can't do that. And I was like, oh, no, no, here are her A plus tests right here. Like, here's, you know, all this. And her other teachers who she was not doing well in those classes, um, became, they were like angry. They were like, well, she's not doing that in my classroom. That's disrespectful. Oh, and that ego. Like, yeah. And it's just the, this ego. It's so funny. It's like you, you, it's more important to you that you have a classroom that looks like a, a classroom, like that looks like compliance where they're just sitting down than that your students are actually learning and succeeding. And it's just blows Girl, me. I did not know we were going to, we were going to get a sermon today, <laughs> but you preach. Wow. Yes. Yes. That. And that I was going to, that's another thing I was going to say, we're going to make a bunch of circles that don't complete and we're going to come back around eventually. Right. That's and I just lost it. it. <laughs> there should be like a jingle whenever there's like a silence where we're just like, wait, where are we going with this? It's like, ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure to put that ADHD. <laughs> So when we're, when I'm doing the editing, I'm just going to do that. So mm -hmm. what was, you just said this. You talk about doodling and then my student got to walk around because accommodations are good. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Cookie cutter. The That's world fun. is not, we're not one big batch of dough that you can put a cookie cutter on and carve out the carbon copies. Everyone is individual. So even putting us in a class of neurodivergence, ADHD, bipolar, whatever label you want to put on a human, still no two neurodivergence are the, the same. Like right. we may have a lot of similar characteristics, but there's so many unique qualities. And I think that the pandemic, the one thing that I think the pandemic for is showing the world, not just America, not just India, not China, the entire world that our shit is broken. Oh Period. yeah. It's broken and it needs, I love that people like you and I are the thought leaders of the future and we're showing how the world could be and probably should be. Now, I notice on your Instagram, I'm an ADHD coach who's passionate about combating shame and embracing neurodiver neurodiversity. It is a mouthful there, <laughs> the $20 word, shame. That's what I know about shame is that guilt and shame keep you trapped in the cycle of guilt and shame. Talk to me about that. Yeah, this is essentially, so we talk about like, okay, so I use the big word executive dysfunction, right? Which is just the, the things that your prefrontal cortex does, which is, grown up things, planning and prioritizing, starting a task and not just staring at your room going, dang, I should really clean this. And then why can't I, right? Like, um, working memory, um, uh, emotional regulation, um, uh, flexible thinking, huge. That's that black and white thinking perfectionism. If I can't do it this way, it's not worth doing all of these things, right? So these are our executive functions. Um, and with ADHD, we struggle with executive functions. Some people believe that's because we have an underdeveloped prefrontal cortex. Some people believe it's because we don't have as much um, connection with our prefrontal cortex, cortex, possibly because 
of our lack of focus and presence in the moment, all these different things, right? So like, um, but what we do know is that all humans lose connection with those abilities of emotional regulation and all these things when we are stressed, when we are anxious, when we are angry, when we are, or even when we're like overly excited, right? That's why like mm -hmm. you see little kids get like, what? and just like run into a wall because they don't have that development yet, right? ADHD kids lot for right longer time. Um, and so we shame <laughs> is this thing that we can cycle with. And I like the, the separation, different people, some people say like shame and toxic shame or whatever. The way that I like it is guilt means you feel bad about something you did. And shame means you feel bad about who you are. Oh, that's really good. Can you say that again for the people in the back? Guilt means you feel bad about something you've done and shame means you feel bad about who you are. And guilt is helpful. We need guilt because we're going to fuck up, right? Like, and we need to know, right? we need to be motivated to do repair. Yes. So guilt is great. Shame is not helpful because shame is not a motivator. Shame creates stagnation. So the more shame you feel, the less you're actually going to try. And the more, and <laughs> and the more shame you feel, that means that you're stressed, you're stuck. And all of a sudden, all those executive functions become much harder. Now, mm -hmm. once you can't clean your room because you're feeling ashamed because you spoke out in class and your teacher yelled at you, and then you come home and you're feeling this, like you're feeling bad. You have this maybe rejection sensitive dysphoria, which is means that you feel rejection a lot more strongly than other people to a point where you'll just ruminate on it for days, years mm. on end, um, right? So you, you're an ADHD kid. You just got scolded at school for a messy desk, for zoning out, for talking out, whatever it is. You Now you come home and for some reason you're having a hard time cleaning, cleaning your room because you're all emotionally dysregulated inside. You've got all that shame. And now your mom comes in and says, come on, I told you to clean your room. I told you five times. Like how many times do I have to tell you? And now that shame, what's wrong with me? Oh my gosh, why does she have to tell me five times? Like I, I'm a terrible person. And now instead of us feeling like, oh crap, mom's mad. I better clean my room to make her feel better. We're thinking, what's the point? I'm inherently flawed. I can't make anybody happy. I can't do anything right. And then it just balls up. Years and years and years of that, we find adults who can't get out of bed in the morning because they don't see the point because they don't think that they're a worthy human being. Um, just because no one understood that their needs were different than someone else's. Not because that they are inherently flawed, but because their struggles are not recognized by other people. So if someone's struggling because they have a broken leg to walk down the street, no one's going to judge you for that. Everyone's going to say, oh, it's totally normal. You're having trouble walking down the street with this broken leg. But if you're having trouble cleaning your room because you're in a shame spiral, there's no empathy for that in our culture. There's no room for that. There's no, hey, let's go. Let's see if we can um, you know, put on some music and make a game of it. You know, let's, let's, let's see if we can go, uh, you know, let's give each other back rubs first to get in a good mood and then we'll go clean the room. Right. Like all of these yeah. things that could, that could be helpful. Um, even like, let's set a timer and see, okay, let's pick up. I did this with my nephews. Like, let's pick up all the green things, go how I like, can see how many green things. And then let's pick up all the red things, you know, just things like that, that can combat the shame anyway. So, oh, oh in wow. all like this, these things that, because our culture doesn't have an understanding of actual reasons for human behavior, we are so stuck in reward and punishment, reward and punishment. That's how you change behavior. And as soon as that doesn't work, we are, people lose their minds. You're like, well, you better beat them. You better put them in jail. You better, because that, they medicate don't Medicate them. Medicate them. You better do something drastic because there's something wrong with this kid that reward and punishment isn't working. And you're like, you know what? That's actually not the best thing to do for anybody <laughs> um, <laughs> at all. And there yeah. are so many other tools out there that people don't, know about they don't understand and so um people go their whole freaking lives i've got people in their 50s and 60s like just getting diagnosed just learning about neurodivergence just learning about executive dysfunction and going holy crap i'm not broken <laughs> like yeah but my struggles were never legitimate legitimized you know just like a, like a neurotypical person will have struggles that people uh validate but a neurodivergent person, an autistic person will be yelled at for not making eye contact or not speaking when spoken to, or, you know, whatever, when that's just not how they work. And so, uh, yeah, it's messed up. We got to change everything. <laughs> yeah, girl, change everything, question everything. That reminds me of recovery, an addict. That they, mm -hmm. nobody wants to be an addict. Nobody wants to identify as an addict. hundred percent. It's a disease, right? You wouldn't tell a cancer patient that there was, like you said, you wouldn't tell someone that was genuinely sick with something that was validated, that was accepted, culturally, accept, uh, socially acceptable. Yeah. 
Yes. Sorry. That, <laughs> and that's that's the other thing is could you imagine? I've always thought of this. Could you imagine a world in which instead of going to school and being put in boxes and told to do what we don't want to do so that we can make someone else money, a world where you actually ask people what they were interested in, encourage that, use the people's strengths. So people like us can get things started. People well, that if they're not struggling with task initiation, yeah. But if it's something they're interested in, 100%, right? It's a completely different situation. Our brains literally turn off when we're bored, you know? <laughs> so like- Exactly. Uh, if some, but if it's something we're interested in, heck yeah. Like, so creating that world where we find out what people are interested in first, instead of going to school, we find out what people are interested in. We create schools for those things. Kind of like those those schools where the, the after, my daughter went to one here in Texas, in, uh, Birdville. It was called the Bechtel, B-C-T-A-L. It's Birdville Center for Training Something. Training something and learning but they had like cosmetology studio, like all those things in there and people get to pick what they want and they excel and they graduate with certification. So my daughter graduated with a certificate for phlebotomy. That's awesome. And she's neurodivergent, but because of the way that, because of the time that I changed in her life and the things that I've learned to manage, she manages the same way and she's excelling now that she's, She's, I keep forgetting the word here, yeah. managing her, managing her weaknesses and focusing on her strengths. There's another word for this. I hate that feeling. Yeah, there's <laughs> so another funny. word. I, I say it. it all the time and I can't pull it right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you were going to say something. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. The, have you heard of the unschooling movement? I have now. <laughs> Okay, so it's exactly what you said. So, okay, oh. it's supposed to be exactly what you said. So there are people who, the idea is that you give kids opportunities and then they whatever they go toward, you foster that and expand it. So let's say that you give a kid a bunch of toys and they love the spaceship. And then you go, okay, let's learn about math. Like how many inches is this spaceship? And let's learn about art. So we're gonna color the spaceship. And now we're gonna learn about history. Like who has been to the moon before, right? Like, and we're gonna learn about English. Let's write some words. Let's write the word spaceship. And you do all that. That is what it's supposed to be. What it has become, unfortunately, I run in a lot of, um, wonderful alternative kind of nature-based circles, right? I'm on the board of directors for Rewild Portland. Check them out, rewildportland.com. Um, and, uh, and, and so I meet a lot of families that uh, talk about you know, that homeschool and have all of these really cool new ways of allowing their children to like experience the world. And through that, I've seen and heard of the dark side of this, which is parents who see unschooling as um, you never tell your kid no, or you never tell them what to do. So you have my, the, my friend was telling me she was on a, um, on like a chat room for this or whatever. And someone was like, my kid plays video games for nine hours a day. Like, what do I do? And they're like, you don't, uh, take the video games away because if that's what they're drawn to, then that sounds like that is a real misunderstanding of like dopamine and like, <laughs> like uh, and all of these things. like like the idea is that you put things in front of the child that is going to lead to learning and then you allow them to drive that learning and i'm not saying video games are terrible but jesus no one should be on video games for eight hours a day um, no unless they're <laughs> unless their video games are like assassin's creed i watched my son play assassin's creed and he actually learned a lot of history from it there's there is a lot of there are a lot of ways that hit that video games can be uh can be educational, can be satisfying, can be, I think, and honestly, a lot of the time they're keeping people alive right now because what if, because of the way that the world is structured, when you feel so completely crappy about yourself and you feel like you are not contributing and you're not getting any of those reward chemicals because you're neurodivergent and you're not getting reward chemicals because you're stuck in a nine to five that you feel is completely useless. And then you get to play this video game and have these little wins and do this problem solving and have socialization. It's an amazing tool 
and also like creates a bunch of other problems, right? Because like, especially with neurodivergence, like we need to move our bodies. We need to uh, regulate our dopamine, like which that too much time on these things like really can make that worse um, and like different things like that, right? So video games are great. Everything's great in moderation, right? But that should not be your school day is just video games. <laughs> like we need to learn a lot of different things. Um, and you definitely can tell your kids no when something is not a good idea. That's, that's the point. Explain why, obviously. But um, anyway, but the, right. the unschooling, there are unschooling programs that are exactly what you described, where they, they have, maybe they'll have a scientist and a sociologist and whatever, like all in one place with a bunch of stuff. And then the kids pick their own projects and they try, and then they help the kids integrate like all the different subjects into that. Yeah. So as you're talking, I'm seeing a vision. Is that neurodivergence? Because people can talk through something and I see the entire future of it, how it could work all the moving parts, and I'm ready to give them their vision. It's like a, a medium or something. So I'm seeing this, the solution to this problem already. Yeah. Tell people what it's not so that you push people away that are wanting that. It's just like authenticity, right? If you're authentic, if you are your authentic self, you will shake off people that don't belong on your frequency and you, are, you will attract more people that are on your frequency and that's 100%. the more authentic I become the better these podcasts get the better guests I get and I I want to say that this is a manifestation of authenticity we are we are vibing on that same level and I love that you mentioned that because it, that's been on my mind ever since the pandemic like I well even before this stuff has been broken I actually think I, I thought of this this concept the first time in eighth grade because I was like this why are we making people do this stuff it's so boring it's so useless I'm never going to have to do this in my life mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell <laughs> right. see there that's that's the only time I get to use it as in a joke right right now there's so much so much when you're asking, is this neurodivergence that you can see all of these things, there is a part of ADHD that has, we are shown to make, we're better at making connections. We make connections faster. We can get from point A to point Z before other people blink, uh, which can be confusing in conversations <laughs> with people sometimes, right? How did you get over there? Um, but so yes. yes, when you're like, oh, suddenly like, you have this idea it's of interest to you it connects to a bunch of other things you have interests in and now all of a sudden da, 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 right like it's like a tree branching out and it becomes very clear very quickly and you have a solution to it um and then of course when it's something that's boring someone's trying to explain to you a very basic concept and you're just like what like so um that, that tends to be the the typical adhd brain thing yeah okay so Tracy Lovejoy and Shannon Lucas wrote a book called Move Fast, Break Shit, Burnout. Catalysts. They started the Catalyst Constellations. They have a Mighty Networks network, uh, Catalyst Galaxy. And it's, I want to say that catalysts are neurodivergence because everyone in there, I relate 100%. And it, like you said, connect dots at lightning speed, have to slow down and get people on the page like, oh crap, I forgot, you're not in my mind. I just had an entire movie play in my head and now I have to explain it to you. Yeah, and it makes it so hard to have, I don't wanna say debates, but like have an exchange of information with someone on like, let's say TikTok. I had a really hard time last night with somebody on TikTok <laughs> who just kept, uh, kept messaging me over and over and over again. And I'm just like, I have a concept of what I'm trying to say to you, but you're not like, I couldn't get there in like a concise way. Right. I'm like, I just need to take all of the, mm. you know, 35 years of learning that I've done and stick it into your brain and then you'll get it. And that, that so sometimes it can become so uh, many connections that it's overwhelming and we don't even know where to start. Absolutely. I'm writing a book called, I have no idea what I'm doing. And that's why it's working. I say I'm writing a book. I started to write a half-assed chapter, introduction. It was great. Then I learned that you write your outline and questions. And I wrote the outline and questions to jog my memory about where to go 
and I've never touched the book again. Yeah, you did that thing where you wrote an outline, so you completed something, so you got the dopamine, and now it's gone. <laughs> Girl, I feel like I'm learning about myself through you, <laughs> and I love it. Because this, knowing, knowing the problem, knowing the problem, accepting that there is a problem is the first step to solving it. Yeah. And I'll, along that line, everything that we know is subject to revision, including the truth. 100%. And I believe that what we do as coaches is we're here to shake it all up. There, there, need, there needs to be change. So I'm glad that you confirmed that. Is there a mantra, quote, or saying that inspires you the most or that changed your life? So sorry. I just almost choked on my water and died. Um. Don't choke on your water and die. At least I'm drinking water. Um, mm -hmm. Breathe. Okay. Yeah, the thing that you just said, I don't know when, I, I don't know how to know when it's done being stuck in my throat. Um, Take, your time. Take your time. Take your time. Do whatever you need to do. Yeah, I don't know what I need on the podcast. Okay, so not, like, this is normal-ish. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, yeah, some of the stuff that you were saying about authenticity, my senior quote was, um, say what you mean and mean what you say, because those who mind don't matter and those who matter don't mind, Dr. Seuss. Mm, yes. That, one, that has been very important in my life. I had, um, my the beginning of my life was rough socially. <laughs> uh, I had a lot of frenemies because girls are, little girls are mean. And, um, and, uh, you know, I was very depressed and uh, there was a certain point where I got so, I had my rock bottom at like nine years old, <laughs> maybe like 10 or 11. And I was just like, I'm either going to kill myself right now, or like, I'm just not going to give a shit anymore. And I, I went with not giving a shit. Thank goodness. Um, and I told those girls that I didn't want to be the friend anymore. And I had no friends for like two years. <laughs> um, and I just drew pictures and wrote stories and read books. And uh, eventually middle school started making friends again, met a bunch of neurodivergents. We didn't know we were neurodivergent, um, you know, through middle school and high school, but I, we knew we understood each other. We knew we were weirdos. And <laughs> as soon as that happened, I was like, oh, okay. So if I just don't put up with people's bullshit, <laughs> and I just am myself, then people who like me will come to me and I will be happy and, and I will understand them and they'll understand me and we can have a, you know, mutually beneficial relationship. And so like, I'm lucky that I had horrible bullies because I came to that realization, you know, 30 years earlier than most people do, I think. <laughs> mm, yeah, because life happens for you, not to you, right? Yep. So I'm, I'm loving that you said that because ever since I can remember, people have compared me to Dr. Seuss or the Weird Al, Weird Al Yankovic of rap. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. I, I love rhyming. And on that note, I, I walked away from my dream because I was trying to conform so much. And I let other people's influence on what I was saying in my music determine it so much that I just stopped trying because there were so many people saying, you need to do this, you need to do that. Don't do this, don't do that. Don't say this. Why do you cuss in your raps? You know what? Not giving a fuck is probably the best thing that's ever happened for me. And it happens on different levels because you don't, you stop caring at the uh, adolescent level, then you stop caring at the teen level, then the 20s and your 30s, there's always that moment. I remember my first one, a teacher, and I'll be quick with this, a teacher went out of the room and left a pregnant teacher, this is when I lived in France, left a pregnant teacher to watch over us. We were being loud. I was in the front. I was actually paying attention and reading for once. And the cloud was the class was being loud. And she comes in there and she stands right in front of my desk and she goes, What are you supposed to be doing? And I went to tell her. And she grabbed my book 
slammed it in my face and said, I didn't ask you. What? I was like, I just felt this tingle. And I was like, I'm done. I'm fucking <laughs> done. And I destroyed her car after school. Oh, like my mom had to buy her a new car. <gasps> yeah, I was in so much trouble, but I didn't care. And I stopped <laughs> caring there. And it just it kept growing. It was already bad before. But like you said, that guilt and that shame, that cycle, that there's something inherently wrong with me and I don't know what to do about it. So F it. Yep, exactly. So say what you mean and mean what you say, because those that matter don't mind and those that mind don't matter. Essentially. <laughs> the other one that is also my favorite, like a like, thing I say all the time. So Ross W. Green says, and I highly recommend all of Ross W. Green's books and uh, collaborative problem solving stuff. As an alternative, if you're stuck in the punishment reward thing with your kids or your life, um, Ross W. Green is a great uh, palatable introduction to alternative methods. Um, and uh, he says, children do well if they can. And I say people do well if they can. Yeah. I don't think that adults are that different, honestly. I don't think that we're that much evolved from kids. Like we're still, we still have our inner, inner children taken over most of the time, especially if you're not aware of it. And I think that we get very caught up in um, like obviously accountability is important. Uh, and and repairing harm is it, that's you know a lot of what I do professionally. But um, but there there I feel like there's a lack of understanding that people do not wake up in the morning and go like, I want to be a dick, <laughs> like, you know, or kids do not wake up in the morning and go, I'm going to be a bad kid. You know, like that happens because of a lot of different reasons. Some of them are biological. Some of them are uh, environmental. Some of them is trauma. Some of it is, you know, like whatever it is, maybe your kid has ADHD. So they're going to have emotional dysregulation. And then on top of everybody keeps criticizing them and they say, okay, fine. You think I'm the bad kid, then I'll just be the bad kid. And I saw that in my four-year-old nephew, I'm hanging out with him. He's into superheroes, you know, and he gets in trouble. He's got a brand new baby sister. So obviously there's a lot of, of excitement and things. So he's getting in trouble a lot more <laughs> um, because he's, you know, hit her in the face and you know, stuff like that. Uh, because he's, you know, dysregulated. Definitely. Yeah. This kid's going to have ADHD. Both his parents do. He's got no, no hope. Um, so, <laughs> but he, um, but you know, and I'm, I'm trying to coach with him and do these things. And I sit with him after he does something like that. And I sit with him in the room and he goes, I'm a bad guy. And I was like, you're not a bad guy. You're a good guy. And he was like, I'm a bad guy. And I was like, why are you a bad guy? And he was like, I want to hit people. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, cause you're angry. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, sometimes I want to hit people dude. That doesn't make you a bad guy. You just got to not hit people. <laughs> you know, even when you want to. And, you know, it, you can see how if a kid was told, oh, you want to hit people, you are a bad guy. You have anger, you are a bad guy over and over. Okay, well, then I'm a bad guy. Immediately that becomes our identity and we start playing that out. Uh, the show Lucifer. I love show. that show. I'm obsessed. Okay, I have like four episodes left to go. So like no spoilers, but like that is the theme of the show. Every time a character, people start treating the character with punishment, with anger, with, you know, uh, isolation, they stop caring. That character starts acting out and acting poorly. It's yes. really like, and it like, it's really, and this whole idea that you become uh, you know, you're, th these characters obviously like are having physical manifestations of their own beliefs about themselves, you know? Um, it's real. Like, it's so real. <laughs> and that's something I've learned dealing with, you know, working with kids that have really severe aggressive behaviors, that, you know, um, that have been the bad kid that have, you know, that are violent and they don't need any more punishment. Most of them have been punished to the fullest extent of punishment. And what they need is to be told, you're not a bad kid. You're just struggling and you, you need some skills. You don't have these skills and we're going to work on them together. And, and that, that's what does it. It's not, they need to be scared straight or whatever. Like that doesn't actually work like in the long term. Um, it's really all about like getting rid of the shame, making people understand that they have growth mindset, right? Like you can do better. I know you want to do better deep down, you know, it's just believing that you can, that's going to make that possible for you. And so supports. And so like, I just feel the same way with adults, even 
when I see somebody being a jerk or even being, you know, biased in certain ways or angry or whatever like this, you'd see, you know, there's so much uh, anger on the internet right now. And it's just, there's no, um, it's almost looked down upon to have empathy for people. Like, no, they can't act like this. We need to shut them down. Like, what do you think happens to people when you cancel that, right? Like, what do you think? They don't disappear. Like people are not disposable. Um, and so like, because we don't have community in the way that humans are supposed to, in the way that we had for millions of years, you know, like um, there's no way for people to have accountability in a healthy way and like have a communal, uh, you know, transformative justice process, essentially, right. um, and which is, uh, and I'm going on a super tangent now, but my point is, no, 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 please keep going. <laughs> like pe people are honestly doing the best they can. And sometimes that's not great, <laughs> you know, but, um, but it's really like, we can't, we, we expect people to magically have skills. We expect people to magically have an open mind when they're taught to be closed-minded. We I, expect people to magically get rid of judgment when they've been judged their whole life and all they know is a world of judgment. We expect people to be able to think outside of a box when they've been punished every time they've tried their whole lives. We expect people to have social skills when that's never taught. We expect people to know how to do repair after they've harmed someone when that was never taught. Like people don't know how to communicate. They don't know how to have empathy for each other. They don't don't know how to see from someone else's perspective and that's not actually their fault in the long run like we are all trapped in this extremely flawed and unhealthy system and so like no matter how bad somebody is like I have to have some amount of empathy for them empathy does not equal tolerance however right just because you understand why someone's that way you feel for them you understand okay like you're you, you're this way for easier. a reason and also i'm not putting up with your shit right you need to stop doing this right like that and that that's hard for a lot of people that this was yeah. a tangent <laughs> no that that wow that's just so you had me in tears because i'm a bad kid that four-year-old my toddler in my head was crying and i that's what i just i wiped away my tears it, it was not okay to cry it i my grandmother tied me to a chair in the middle of the kitchen and left me there. I was wearing red pajamas. My sister comes in. I've been tied up all day. I tried to jump to the bathroom because I had to pee and she took a nap and I didn't want to pee myself because then I'd be in trouble for that too. I get to the bathroom. I fall over. She beats me till I bleed. I pee myself. I'm put right back in the middle of the kitchen and I'm in trouble for leaving a toy on the ground and her tripping over it, right? And then you never did anything wrong again because you were properly punished, right? Absolutely. I became an angel after that. My sister walks in and she stops. And she's like, every time she came home, there was something wrong. She goes, what did you do this time, Gregory? I looked at grandma and I told her I was the devil. Or I, I said, I am the devil. And that that's when that what you just said hit me because I realized when it happened and what it was that has kept me feeling the guilt and shame my whole life. Like there has been a breakthrough today on this podcast and I did not even know that was coming. And yeah, I'm a little emotional now. So thank you. Uh, wow. That, I mean, I didn't, and the other part you, that you said, we expect people to know these things like I was in trouble all the time because I was expected to know what I should know and no one taught me. I'm expected to know not to do these things and it's the first time I've ever experienced it and you never told me, then I did it. Then you got mad at me because I did it and I got my ass beat. Why? Now I'm confused. Now I, I don't even know. Lying is wrong, telling the truth is wrong. I'm gonna have my ass beat either way. Doing great things is, is, I mean, I don't know what is what because there is no community. There is no teaching anymore, or there wasn't with us growing up. And we're, we're doing what we can to change it now. On that note, is there a question that you think everybody should be asking themselves? There's so many. I thought about this before and I was like, all of them. Um, <laughs> Let me think. Wait. Oh, I, I 
took notes to be ready. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So here are the questions that I came up with immediately the yes, five please. minutes that I read these questions before this interview. Um, <laughs> um, the first one is what are you missing? So like in any story, in any situation, like what's the thing you're not seeing? I think that that's important to continuously ask yourself constantly. I also think you should ask why are people acting the way they are for the exact reason that I just talked about, right? Like yes. actually exploring that, not because they're a jerk. Like, yeah, people are jerks, but there's a there's something behind that because we all innately want connection and community and respect and uh, you know love. And so what, if someone's acting not in accordance with that, something's wrong within them, right? So like trying to, I find it so fun to figure out what that thing is and then, and then try to, um, try to see through it and like really yeah. see the person for who they could be, you know, um, who they are outside of the bullshit. Um, and then where did my opinions come from is another one. Like, why do I have this opinion? Um, which is hard because we definitely all live in little, uh, echo chambers right now. And so thinking like, have I, heard the other side of this ever in a legitimate way, not in like wow. a mocking way. Um, <laughs> and then um, where did the voices in my head come from? Ooh. So if wow. you're yourself, you know, I'm stupid, I'm not good enough, what's wrong with me, these things, like where, who's the first person to say that to you? Where did those voices come from? Um, and some, maybe some, no one said it, but the way that they acted, like put those ideas in your head, um, you know, and then you think, would I feel the same way about a kid or a person that was doing what I was doing? You know, did, if someone else was acting, that's here's a good one. If someone else was doing what I was doing, would I be as hard on them as I'm being on myself? <laughs> That's a great question. If someone, wow. If someone, so just start with empathy. 100% all the time. <laughs> I'm just, I'm going to play this back when, when it's all over and dig out all the meat because there's so much. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for coming on the show. This Thank has you been so much for having me. This is fun. I just just get to like barf all over you. It's wonderful. <laughs> and I just love taking it. So it's just beautiful. It works out perfect. Two more things. Mm -hmm. Who are two people that you know that are killing their goals right now, crushing their goals, winning at life, that you'd love to see me interview on the on the show? I immediately thought of two of uh, two people that I met on TikTok who have recently changed career goals because they are embracing their true selves and, and mm, uh, yes. embracing their true values. And that would be um, Laura Barato, who is burritos and ADHD on TikTok. And then I don't know Tiana's last name, um, but Tiana, my sweet on TikTok, she uh, just started, she has uh, ADHD and uh, borderline personality disorder and is just really has come to this like beautiful place of self-acceptance and trying to create. So she, she's just started a business that she's trying to make a nonprofit that's um, available to everyone um, where it's like a body doubling business. So it's essentially creating that community that we are lacking in our culture. And so, you know, it's like, let's all brush our teeth together for the people that really struggle with executive dysfunction, with that task initiation, with doing those basic things. Um, she's creating a space where, you know, body doubling is something for ADHD. It's a coping strategy where just having another person around helps us get things done and it's so it's so true it's it's the best it is the ultimate right coping strategy. aside from the self-coaching and the just you know um but so i i really want to support her business because um i think it's something that we need and i love how she's making it a nonprofit. she's making it accessible and then laura barato she's my uh she's actually my fitness coach and i'm her adhd coach we have a little tradesies going on um but she is uh has just sort of uh, come to terms with her ADHD and autism and, and how, how that has affected her life and going through all of her trauma and doing all these things. And so she, uh, is brilliant and she knows so much about neurodiversity in the body. Um, and has, is, she owns a gym in Tennessee, I think I, I, I <laughs> I've trained with her over zoom. Um, but she specializes in now training neurodivergent 
people because understanding that they need have different needs for their bodies for moving their bodies and for accountability like for con, for a continuity with with moving our bodies and, and making that a joyful thing instead of a shame thing it's not like i need to lose weight or i should have more muscle or all of these things it's like no what are ways that i can move my body to feel better and to uh deal with all of my inner demons through physicality which is such an important thing for neurodivergence and so i'm i'm really excited about her pivoting her business to be directed toward that and then i have a third person because yes, of all the questions thing um there's uh this dude aaron johnson he works with us sometimes through rewild portland um he's an anti-racist educator and but his like thing is questioning like he loves questions like for like his birthday he asks people to give him questions um so i thought that that might be a cool uh thing you see me lighting up this is genuine <laughs> i am i used to hate questions because questions meant that something else was coming they were always leading up to something worse and so i never knew what was coming after a question now i question everything right on that body doubling i actually had a conversation with a friend that she mentioned body double. I'd never heard of it before, but I realized the screen behind me, as soon as it went up, my productivity went down because my wife will be on the bed and I can't feel her or see her. And now I can't get the, anything done. Like I, I'm the toddler in the control center with no accountability. You need a babysitter. <laughs> because of that, that conversation, we just started our first meetup called M3. So it's M3 plus multi-dimensional multi-dimensional mutual mentorship we provide a space for people to come it's also nonprofit. we provide a space for people to come if they need to get something done in the tech field ux designer if they're designers product owners or product managers developers whoever needs to come and actually get something done because you can go to a meetup you can go learn hear someone speak and that's great but when you go home are you going to apply that so come here learn, get a mentor, actually get a project started there, and then link up with people. And when you leave, now you have an accountability partner to get some, some things done. And it was a really great meeting. And I'm really excited about where it's going. So we do it once a month now. This was the first one. Next one is August 26th. I, I just love that you mentioned body doubling. I can't wait to talk to you, Tiana. Uh, please send me those as well. And then last question. Where can they find you? I know I talked about it in the very beginning, but I want them to hear it from you. Okay. This is my weakness is like marketing myself with, while still feeling authentic. Um, I, I, so I always kind of go to being cheesy, like, okay, so find me on, you know, trying to find that within myself of like, you know, <laughs> um, it feels, it feels weird. Um, but it, you know, this is all new. I never ran my own business before. Like I, I told you before we started recording, uh, ending up on TikTok and things like that was an accident. Um, <laughs> just wanted to troll my my students. Um, but so I am on TikTok as ADHD Coach Sheila. I'm also on Instagram as ADHD Coach Sheila. If you, I think I'm on like Twitter and Facebook too, but I don't know about that. Anyway, so. <laughs> um, but if you want any of my services, like group coaching, so you can have those a same similar like accountability group thing, meet some like minded people if you're neurodivergent. Um, I have some ADHD group uh, group coaching right now. I have two groups that are for ADHDers. Coming soon will be the an ADHD autism combo uh, group because those two combined is a little bit different than either one. And so my friend who's autistic um, and ADHD might be doing that with me. Um, and so that is going to be super fun. And then I have classes. So if you struggle with, I have a, a class that's just task initiation. So if you just struggle to get started on things, you struggle to get things done, you struggle to like, I mean, that could be from like getting your work done on time to cleaning your room to, you know, the dishes to texting your friends back, uh, remembering that your friends exist, um, all of those things, uh, that's the task initiation class. And then, uh, this coming, not, not tomorrow weekend, but, um, August 8th through sixth through eighth. Anyway, that weekend, uh, I have an executive dysfunction webinar with another ADHD coach, Amanda Carey. Um, and she's amazing because she's really good at like the organization stuff. That's not my forte. And so like, we're a good match that way. And she also is like really deep diving into mindfulness and meditation that is ADHD friendly, which is super exciting. Um, and then I'm going to go into a lot of like the emotional regulation task initiation. And then we're also, you know, flex flexible thinking, memory, all of the executive functions 
questions, talk about why your brain struggles the way that it does, and then things that you can do to fix it. And some of those are very practical tips. And some of those are some of the mindset stuff that we talked about today and um, all that. Oh, and I know these are online classes and people are with ADHD are like, what? You want me to sit online for six hours? But like, I have ADHD guys. Like I know Take what my money <laughs> I have, like, I mean, we, my slides are all memes and cartoons. First of all, like you're very welcome to doodle knit, have your baby on your back. Like, I don't care. You can eat all of get up and move around. I got people doing jumping jacks in the background. I don't, I, I want you to take care of yourself. And there's lots of breaks. There's lots of activities. There's an yes. the best part of the groups is really that there's tons of breakout time where you're interacting with other neurodivergents. You're talking to people who have the same experiences and struggles as you. It's so magically validating. Like the, I just finished an, um, an ADHD 101 class. So I also have an, a class now, now I'm calling it ADHD simplified. Um, but uh, so my ADHD simplified class is literally everything you could want to know about ADHD smashed together. Um, and I just taught that class online. I had ADHDers sitting with me for like five hours. Everybody loved it. Like I got great feedback. And the, the thing that was, was emotional was them getting to talk to each other and feel validated and feel not alone. Um, and, you know, at the end, everybody shared contacts and we've got accountability partners and things like that now. So um, I would love if you join me for my classes. I am going to push you to everyone I know that is neurodivergent that you don't know yet. Thank you. That would be wonderful. <laughs> wow. Like this has been just a breakthrough for me, knowing that this exists. And I know I watch your stuff not as much as I probably should, but I, I try to stay off TikTok and Instagram because healthy. Yeah, do that. <laughs> I, I cannot stop once I start. It's really hard to stop, but thank you. Wow. I'm going to stop the recording. But, Thank you so much. This was super fun. Yes. Well, we'll talk for a second and then, yeah. Wow. Thank you guys. Question everything. <laughs>